Hi guys, welcome, welcome back to the initiative of news in 30 minutes. I hope you people had a relaxing time during the last 10 days. But I also hope that you people have revised whatever has been done in the previous sessions of news in 30 minutes. And I sincerely hope that you have not stopped reading newspapers. And I have told you, newspapers are not just one activity that you do in a day. It should become your lifestyle. It should become a practice that you will do until you see your name in that final list. So newspaper is something that you cannot stop at any time in your preparation or otherwise. Okay. And uh, we are resuming the news in 30 minutes. So we will be proceeding with news in 30 minutes from today till the month of April. That is, we will stop it in the month of May because everyone will be sincerely preparing for prelims and our focus will also be on preparing students for prelims. But until April, we will be continuously doing till the end of April. Till the end of April, we will be continuing with the news in 30 minutes initiative. So please tuning, uh, please keep tuning in to this initiative and listening to it so that you don't lose out on your thinking abilities. You don't stop thinking. Uh, you know, how to link different aspects of current affairs into your static syllabus as well as how to think to write better answers, how to think to make sure that you become a better individual. So in that manner, don't stop viewing the news in 30 minutes. Okay. So another thing is there is a surprise as I've told you and uh, that surprise will be coming or will be launching that very soon. That will help you exclusively for your prelims preparation okay so i'll be revealing that very soon but with that let us now get on with the important issues of today on 8th of january 2024 all right let us start off let us get back to that rhythm and let us make sure that we start enjoying the same intensity of current affairs that we used to do it 10 days back so get on let's get on with it guys the first issue is maldives minister tweets over PM Modi's recent Lakshadweep visit that has sparked row in several social media, uh, you know, uh, handles. Okay. So what is this issue? The issue is mainly between Maldives new government. The Maldives government is seem seeming to be pro China. And on this lines, the president of Maldives has told the naval uh, you know uh, troops that were there in maldives to vacate their positions also on top of that the maldivian uh, president has also ordered to stop hydrographic surveys uh, you know that were happening in the indian ocean along the coast of maldives so all this shows that the maldivian government is more pro china than india However, what we should not forget is Maldives is dependent on tourism and the largest tourism around 11 to 12 percent of the total tourism of Maldives is from India. So India is a very important economic actor for the growth of Maldives. So Maldives should not forget the importance of India. However, when uh, recently our prime minister had gone to Lakshadweep, the Maldives ministers have tweeted in the name of freedom of speech to spread hatred and derogatory statements against our prime minister. This has resulted in their suspension. However, though the issue is more political for us, both from prelims and mains perspective, what is important is this Lakshadweep. We have to learn more about this Lakshadweep. We have to understand what is the importance of our Lakshadweep that is in news. So let us get on with it. The first is if we take Lakshadweep, okay, it is along the west coast of India in the Arabian Sea. That is one, it is in the Arabian Sea. Next, it is 220 to 440 kilometers away from the city of Kochi. It is away from the city of Kochi, or we can also say it is 200 to 400 kilometers away from Kerala coast the next is the these are group of coral islands they are group of coral islands this coral islands can also be given the name of 
atolls they can be given the name of atolls the next is they are a group of 36 islands they are a group of 36 islands out of this 36 islands 10 islands are inhabited 10 islands are inhabited that is another information the next is if you take lakshadweep the capital of lakshadweep is kavaratti the capital is kavaratti r a t t i kavaratti okay and the main important commercial crop of lakshadweep is coconut okay other food grains are very less grown the most important crop in lakshadweep is coconut the reason is because lakshadweep is mainly made up of coral sand and this coral sand has very low water holding capacity okay it has very low water holding capacity hence the major crop that is grown is coconut however there are a lot of fruits and vegetables that are grown in lakshadweep some of the important fruits and vegetables that are grown in lakshadweep is banana there is wild almond then there is bread fruit and then there is drumsticks these are some of the fruits and vegetables that are grown in lakshadweep lakshadweep also has a bird sanctuary that is pity island pity island is declared as a bird sanctuary the next is androt androt is the largest island of lakshadweep it is not minikoi it is androt that is the largest island of lakshadweep the next is the culture of lakshadweep if you take the culture the important art forms is kolkali and parichakali these are the important dance art forms okay dance art forms of lakshadweep this is practiced in all of lakshadweep except the island of minikoi in minikoi they practice another special type of dance form called lava okay this is the dance form that is more famous in minikoi apart from minifoi minikoi the kolkali and parachikali are two art forms that are very famous in the rest of the islands and in marriages in lakshadweep in marriages they practice something called oppana they practice something called oppana oppana means this is a, a you know feature where a song is sung by a lead singer and this singer is then followed by the group of women in singing okay so this is known as oppana so these are some of the important aspects that you should know about arab i mean lakshadweep which falls in the arabian sea okay as i've already told you there are coral islands coral islands means they will be very rich in fishes and lakshadweep is very famous for aesthetic fishes okay aesthetic fishes okay aesthetic fishes means those fishes that have very very decorative or very very vibrant appearance okay some of the examples of aesthetic fishes are some of the example of aesthetic fishes are there is parrot fish there is surgeon fish okay and also there is butterfly fish okay parrot fish butterfly fish and surgeon fish these are the important aesthetic fishes so these are some important information that you should know about lakshadweep now as uh, to just give you a diagrammatic representation of how lakshadweep looks before i show you the diagram because diagram will do injustice on your memory i'll just give you the diagram there are three group of islands okay you have amandivi group of islands you have amandivi group of islands then you have kananoor kananoor group of islands okay and then you have minikoi there's an island called mini koi okay so you have here the amandivi group of islands okay here you have an island called androt as i told you this is the largest island okay and then you have your kananoor group of islands okay you have a number of uh, islands here and here comes the kavaratti that is the capital of lakshadweep which is a union territory and just to tell you this union territory was formed it was formed as a union territory in 1956 uh, sorry it was formed as union territory in 1956 and the name lakshadweep was given in 1973 
okay that's another information from prelims perspective okay so overall if you observe this is about lakshadweep here there is something called nine degree channel that is the latitude that separates minikoi with the rest of lakshadweep however there is another channel called eight degree channel and eight degree channel separates lakshadweep from maldives it is maldives that is in news because of all the unnecessary uh, you know um, you know tweets that came out from the ministers of maldives however this is the distance of maldives with lakshadweep okay maldives is separated from lakshadweep by 8 degree channel and minikoi is separated from the rest of lakshadweep by 9 degree channel okay so overall this together is the part of india that is known as lakshadweep the amandivi group of islands the kananur group of islands as well as the minikoi okay now let me show you the diagram so that you get a clarity over it you can see this okay so from the coast of kerala from the coast of kerala you have around 200 to 400 kilometers you will find lakshadweep as you can see the group of lakshadweep islands you have kavarati which is the capital you have androt okay that is around 293 kilometers okay you have kadmut you have chetlat okay you have bangar bangaram okay which is very important because there was a coral uh, summit that happened there then you have agatti okay there is a flight i mean there is a helicopter service from kavarati to agatti okay anyway so all this are one amandavi group of islands kananur group of islands separated by an 8 degree channel that is uh, you know separating the lakshadweep with minikoi okay the rest of lakshadweep with minikoi however together all these islands are uh, known as Lakshadweep group of highlands again here comes 9 degree I'm sorry 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 this is 9 degree channel and this is 8 degree channel okay so 9 degree channel uh, you know is the channel that separates the rest of Lakshadweep with Minikoi and 8 degree channel separates Lakshadweep with Maldives so this is the overall map so I'll show you another atlas uh, based map as you can see uh, there is uh, 9 degree channel here there is 8 degree channel here there is mini koi and you can see the kavarati islands the amandivi islands okay so this is the overall uh, you know uh, the information about lakshadweep so i hope i have covered it from the prelims perspective this is how when you get any place in news you have to dig deeper and you have to understand the place geographically uh, you know thoroughly in your visual memory all right any question can come from any different angles but this is the overall summary of what lakshadweep is geographically as well as culturally so i hope i have covered it from different dimensions for prelims okay so this is about the first issue the next issue is again this this was launched one week back but it has been making news because it is a moment of pride for all our country uh, countrymen because we launched uh, you know aditya l1 mission and we are about to launch the we are we are getting ready for gaganyan mission gaganyan mission includes sending uh, you know astronauts to the low earth orbit three astronauts will be sent to the low earth orbit and uh, you know they will be staying there for three days and then we have to get them back so that is what is the gaganyan mission so we are trying to you know uh, prepare ourselves for manned mission now along with that the next is the expo sat that was launched one week back expo means x-ray polarimeter x-ray polarimeter satellite x-ray polarimeter satellite that is what is the meaning of expo sat so india launches a space mission to study black holes okay another headline says exposite launch makes india the second country with a black hole space observatory as you already know we have spent we have sent astrosat we sent astrosat in 2015 this is a satellite in order to uh, you know study astronomy that is to study different celestial objects okay this is to basically uh, study different celestial objects so this was sent in 2015 
the next space observatory that was sent was so this was the first space observatory the next space observatory that was sent was aditya l1 mission this was sent for the satellite to be placed in l1 lagrange point between the sun and earth at a distance of 1.5 million kilometers from earth and here it is going to observe the sun directly all the time because it is in the lagrange point it can observe the sun all the time so that is the second space observatory that india has sent the third space observatory that india is sending or india has already sent is the third is the expo sat okay this is the third space observatory the first is basically a observatory to observe the entire astronomy or celestial objects and the observation will be done mainly in the uh, you know ir as well as optical spectrum optical spectrum means visible spectrum so this is basically the observation that is done also what you should understand is it also observes x ray spectrum also so don't forget in the exam if they ask this astrosat that was launched in 2015 also has the ability to observe celestial objects at the spectrum of x ray then if this has the uh, ability to observe the celestial objects at x ray then what is the difference between this exposat and x uh, astrosat i will get back to that before that understand the first space observatory was astrosat launched in 2015 the second was aditya l1 mission that was launched last year and in 2024 we have launched the exposat that is our third observatory okay now what is this exposat as i told you the full form the full form of exposat is x ray polarimeter okay so you have x ray polarimeter see if you take a celestial body that is emitting energy now the energy emitted basically if you take sun the sun emits energy that is known as incoming solar radiation okay so this incoming solar radiation will is nothing but an electromagnetic radiation and if i take this electromagnetic radiation this radiation is of different energy it is of different energy and because it is of different energy i can spread this energy over a spectrum and that spectrum will range from vib goyor that is from violet to red and anything greater than violet is uv rays anything greater than uv rays is x rays and anything greater than x rays is gamma rays okay in the same manner red anything less than red is ir anything less than that is radio waves okay now why am i explaining all this is this is known as the electromagnetic spectrum this is known as the electromagnetic spectrum okay so now what you should understand is this electromagnetic spectrum is the radiation that is coming from the sun sun is our star hence Uh, you know the radiation is coming from our sun but in our universe there are several stars so all these stars will emit radiation and all those radiations will range from this different energy levels okay that is the first thing that you should learn okay now usually what happens the satellites the satellites that are absorbing i mean that sorry the satellites that are observing the celestial bodies the satellites are observing the celestial bodies they will have the ability to observe the celestial bodies in a particular spectrum what are the spectrums the spectrum can be either see radio waves or ir so all the uh, energy that is coming from this spectrum can be observed by few satellites few satellites that are more stronger can observe the spectrum in the visible light okay they can observe in the visible light and few satellites that are very very powerful that have very good uh, sensors and that they are very good uh, in capturing the high energy level can also observe uv rays and x rays okay as i told you astrosat that we have launched has the ability to observe mainly this visible spectrum and ir however it also has the ability to observe x rays coming out of the celestial bodies okay then the difference between exposat and uh, you know x uh, this x ray observation by astrosat is x sorry exposat is a satellite that will help observe polarized x rays it will help observe polarized x rays okay that is the difference between exposat and normal astrosat 
Astrocyte can only observe the X-rays emitted by the radiated body. However, Exposite can observe something called polarized X-rays. Okay, polarized X-rays means, see, what do you mean by polarized? Polarized means when the wave is, uh, you know, restricted to one direction. When the wave is restricted to one direction. Okay, for example, the wave, when it goes, it can go in different, different directions. Okay, if the wave is restricted in one direction, then you call this as polarized wave. Okay, so the speciality of exposite is that it can observe X-ray that is polarized. The next question comes, why is the X-ray getting polarized? The X-ray will usually get polarized when the X-rays when the X-rays comes in contact with strong magnetic field. When the X-rays comes in contact with strong magnetic field, then the X-rays will get polarized. That is, it does not travel, the waves will not travel in different, different directions. It will always travel in one regular definite direction. In the direction that it is polarized, in the same direction it starts traveling. So, I told you, one exposite can capture polarized X-rays. And X-rays will get polarized when they come in contact with strong magnetic field. And strong magnetic field comes with respect to three different celestial objects. Okay. Strong magnetic field comes with respect to neutron stars, with respect to black holes, and with respect to something called magnetrons. Okay. So in these three celestial objects, because the magnetic field is very strong, the X-rays that pass through this neutron stars, black holes or magnetars, these X-rays will be highly polarized. Because these X-rays will be highly polarized, you need high energy sensors to capture this, high energy technology to capture this. And this is where Exposite comes in. This is the speciality of Exposite. So Exposite basically is a satellite that captures the polarized x-rays so i hope you understood what is the importance of exposat now more information about this exposat is launched to a low earth orbit so from low earth orbit it is going to uh, you know monitor the uh, these uh, polarized x-rays uh, so polarized x-rays will help us study these things magnetrons neutrons and more importantly black holes that is why in the headlines you saw that it is a black hole observatory, but it's not true completely because we are not only studying about black holes, we are studying about different, different other celestial objects. Basically, we are studying all those celestial objects that has very strong magnetic field that will make X-rays more polarized. Okay. The next is Exposite that is launched in low earth orbit, approximately 650 kilometers from the surface. It is carrying two payloads it is carrying two payloads the payloads are one is polix this is the payload the second is expect this is the payload these are the two important payloads polix means polarimeter instrument in x-rays Ex except means x-ray spectroscopy and timing you don't have to know exactly what they mean you can know the full form if you want to polix is again polarimeter instrument in x-rays expect is x-ray spectroscopy and timing okay these are the two important payloads that the exposite has carried okay and exposite is uh, is is the uh, you know first satellite that is trying to make x-ray polarization measurements it is trying to make x-ray polarization measurements at the energy band of at the energy band of 8 to 30 keV okay so it is the first to make measurements at x-ray polarization measurements it is first to make x-ray polarization measurements at the energy band of 8 to 30 keV this has been never attempted before this is first time being attempted by ISRO in the world so this is something again that shows the prowess of ISRO okay so i hope i have given a very basic level of understanding of what this exposite is because i've been reading the newspaper from the last one week 
no article has simplified this concept okay so i hope i have done a fair job in making sure you understood what this concept of expo sat is okay what is our third observatory that we have launched after astrosat in 2015 aditya l1 in uh, 2023 and exposat in 2024 these are the three important space based observatories that have been launched with their own unique purpose and unique advantages i hope you have learned this space is very very important from both prelims and mains perspective so have very good clarity in these concepts okay so this is about the second issue let us move on to the next issue the next issue is a concept called structured negotiation okay this is a new type of alternative dispute resolution mechanism okay it is the new type of alternative dispute resolution mechanism that has emerged this has become very famous especially in usa and in usa it has become very famous especially in resolving something called disability rights okay so what the author has done the author has mainly spoken in terms of disability rights but what you should not forget is structured negotiation is something of a concept that can be used in different sectors and in different parts of governance okay so you need not always confine it to the disability sector or disability rights but it is just an alternate dispute resolution mechanism that is actually becoming more and more famous in usa okay so what is this structured negotiation one you should understand structured negotiation is mainly solution driven it is mainly solution driven that is the first thing the second is it involves the defaulted service provider you bring the defaulted service provider to the table and you impress upon them you impress upon them the benefits of compliance okay that benefit of compliance can be mainly social welfare legislation it can be any social welfare legislation because this is these are some of the legislations that are neglected by the service providers you are bringing the service providers to the table and then impressing upon them what are the advantages of this compliance so when you do that you are trying to bring something called win win situation okay so it is a win win situation on the side of one the service provider on the side of the complainant that is the citizen so citizen also wins the side the service provider also wins so that is what is structured negotiation now the one difference is the person who is arbitrated or the person who is uh, you know uh, you know looked over the entire uh, structured negotiation that person will keep monitoring to make sure that whatever the common ground that was reached is kept uh, going forward as well okay the words that are you know promised within the common ground must also be uh, you know kept forward also and this is monitored by the arbitrated party okay so this is what is structured negotiation to just repeat it structured negotiation is a solution driven concept where the defaulted service provider is brought to the table and is impressed uh, upon the benefits of compliance especially in social welfare legislation okay now it results in win win situation where a citizen is also winning because that citizen will now get access to the market and the citizens grievances are resolved that is wow citizen wins a uh, service provider wins because the service provider will now not have to you know spend more okay so high cost litigation this is also high cost litigation is also uh, you know uh, you know avoided and it also avoids negative publicity it also avoids negative publicity so in this way win win situation is something that we can uh, reach and one more aspect is the arbitrated uh, party will monitor if whatever the compromise is done is kept uh, intact going forward so this is what is structured negotiation okay now this structured negotiation is becoming very famous with respect to disability rights especially in usa now the author gives a case study of paytm It, uh, the author gives a page, uh, I mean case study of Paytm. The author tells that according to 
the rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 according to this rights if there is non compliance on any provision if there is non compliance on any provision now if this is the case if there is non compliance on any provision then complaint can be raised to the chief commissioner of persons with disabilities okay this this person is known as the chief commissioner on persons with disabilities so if there is non compliance by anyone on any of the provisions of this rights of persons with disabilities then the person who is suffering from that particular non compliance can raise a complaint to the chief commissioner of persons with disabilities so this is what happened and when this happened the ccpd told the ptm that they have to improve their digital application they have to improve their digital application to make it more accessible make it more accessible to the persons with disabilities this is what was told by ccpd also ccpd marked the paytm for non compliance okay now what happened see paytm suffered from uh, embarrassment because it had negative publicity the second is paytm was now put under pressure to comply to make it more accessible to persons with disabilities now paytm in that hurry tried to do some changes that actually made the application more inaccessible so such methodologies where uh, you know uh, uh, an organization is ordered to bring accessibility very fast can be counterproductive so in these cases the author says that instead of trying to order instead of the commis chief commissioner of persons with disabilities ordering the ccpd should have undertaken something called structured negotiation if structured negotiation would have been undertaken then you call paytm to a private meeting that is to a common table you discuss about the benefits of compliance you discuss about the benefits of compliance of disabled you discuss the benefits of compliance of people with disabilities accessing paytm you talk about how that will increase the market value that will increase the transactions which in turn will help paytm itself and by interesting them about the benefits of making it accessible now you uh, you know give them more time to implement or give them more time to make sure that their application becomes more accessible to the disabled in this way now because of structured legislation or i'm sorry structured negotiation one you are saving them from high cost of litigation you are also saving them from negative publicity and it will also help the disabled persons of dis i mean the persons with disabilities to also enjoy and access paytm in the future okay so however what is important is the ccpd that is the chief commissioner on persons with disabilities should monitor the paytm continuously to make sure that there is improvements to improve the accessibility of the application for people with disabilities so this is what is the application of structured negotiation so what i am trying to tell you is structured negotiation is just a type of alternate dispute resolution mechanism that can be used in many different aspects of governance so you can use this to solve between center and state you can use this to solve between public and private you can use this to solve between public and citizen so this is something that you can use in your answers as well as in your case studies if they are asking your suggestion or if they are asking you to bring out some innovative measures in order to solve any problem so i hope you can use this in your answers at the utmost discretion of your choice so i hope this was clear let us get on with the next issue the next issue is about horticulture in india and the indian institute of horticulture research comes under the indian council on agricultural research that is one the next is indian institute of horticulture research has its headquarters in bengaluru okay and iihr technologies help improve food and nutrition security among tribals in various states says union agricultural minister the union agricultural minister also noted that more than 150 technologies were commercialized 
and licensed so far through commercial wing of icar that is agri innovate and have been generating approximately 4 crores every year okay now this technologies is very very important the technologies i'm sorry the technologies that as you know come out due to the efforts of indian institute of horticultural research has helped improve productivity of horticultural crops immensely in india that is what something you should know okay if you go to the iihr website there are more than 260 technologies that are released by iihr exclusively in order to improve the productivity of horticulture crops okay now just to give you a background if we talk about horticulture if we talk about horticulture in india if we take the year 1950-51 and if we compare it with 2022-23 in 1950-51 in the overall output of horticultural crops was 25 million tons in 2022-23 it is 350 million tons it is 350 million tons look at the improvement india has made in almost 75 years okay this is almost 14 times improvement in the food productivity i'm sorry in the horticultural productivity the next is this has surpassed the 350 million ton has surpassed the total food grain production so our horticultural production is actually greater our horticultural production is actually greater than our food grain production that is another proud moment and as i told you for this to happen indian institute of horticultural research has played a very very important role okay i have noted down some important technologies they have introduced however as i told you in their website they have introduced more than 260 technologies the 60 novel technologies that they have introduced has played an immense role in India's success in horticulture. Okay, so that again shows the prowess of India's scientific minds in the country to make India Atmanirbhar Bharat. Okay, now a few technologies that has been introduced by them is one is Doddridge rootstock. This is this technology is mainly for grapes. Doddridge rootstock. The second is Arka Rakshak. This is for tomato. Okay. The third is Arka Prajwal. Okay. This is for tuber rose. The next is Osmatic Dehydration. They have uh, brought this technology called Osmatic Dehydration. This is for several different fruits. Don't think that there is only one fruit. I'll just write an example of one fruit, but there are several fruits like goa, jackfruit. So they have introduced something called osmotic dehydration. The next is they have come up with something called dried flower technology. Okay, that is one more technology. The next is bunch feeding. They have come up with something called bunch feeding in banana and the last one that i felt was interesting was there was a salt tolerant acid lime variety that they have created that is known as tenali okay that is salt tolerant acid lime variety known as tenali these are few technologies that when i went through the website i could find there are few more that you can go to the iihr website you just type iihr and technologies it will take you directly to the website and you can look at it okay however this is the status of horticulture in india we have made tremendous progress of almost 14 times in the last 75 years and we have our horticultural production surpasses the food grain production in india okay so this is about this issue the last issue of the day is rain in loose tongued kerala minister okay while his contention that the priest could have raised the manipur issue with pm is somewhat valid his language was certainly insulting in nature basically i'll give you the background the background is several christian priests uh, attended a ceremony that was hoisted by our prime minister 
and in that uh, you know function the priest did not raise the manipur issue that is the problem of this kerala minister however the way that the kerala minister has spoken is very bad and very wrong it hurts the sentiments of one particular section of the society it should not be done so being a public representative it is not uh, you know admissible as well as it is not advisable okay that is the problem of these words but the reason is why i am taking this issue is not because of that at all because the questions will not come on that the reason is this same kerala minister had once spoken that our constitution was set up to rob people our constitution was set up to rob people and when this statement was made this minister was booked under a act known as prevention of insults to national honor act 1971 see this was the act where this minister was booked for demeaning one of the national symbols of india that is the indian constitution okay so this is why it is this is important this act is important okay now let me just give you a background in our article if we have if we if i take the article of the constitution called 51a this is the fundamental duties this talks about the fundamental duties of india in this fundamental duties there are three aspects that our fundamental duty tells us tells us to protect okay the one is constitution we have to abide by the constitution and value the and, and also uphold the constitutional values that is one next we also have to respect our national flag and we also have to respect our national anthem we have to respect our national anthem so our fundamental duties in accordance to article 51a says we have to uphold our constitution and abide by the constitutional values we have to respect our national flag and national anthem so these are the three i'm sorry yeah these are the three important national honors which are explicitly which are explicitly mentioned in the fundamental duties of the indian constitution and to protect this we have enacted something called prevention of insults to national honor act 1971 okay so in this basically there is section 2 section 2 of this act basically protects it protects our national flag it protects our national flag and constitution how does it protect our national flag and constitution anything that is done to insult our national flag and constitution will be met with imprisonment and fine that is how we will protect our national flag and constitution the next is section 3 section 3 basically talks about preventing preventing or creating a disturbance preventing or creating a disturbance while singing national anthem okay that is preventing or creating a disturbance while singing national anthem so you can see the section 2 is talking about national flag and constitution section 3 is talking about national anthem in this way all the three that are explicitly mentioned in our fundamental duties are protected and preserved from insults allow according to this act prevention of insults national honor act 1971 okay there is one more section called section 3a this section 3a is for repeated offenders this section 3a is for re repeated offenders so basically this is the act that i wanted to talk so two things that has happened because of loose tongue one several of our public representatives talk bad about national symbols which should not be done which is actually wrong constitutionally as well as legally the next is the other ministers like the maldives minister who has tweeted wrongly about the indian public representative is also wrong freedom of speech does not equate you can spread hatred freedom of speech does not dictate that you can spread enmity okay both are not allowed so freedom of speech is not absolute freedom of speech comes with certain restrictions which are called reasonable restrictions and especially for public servants especially for public representatives they have to always abide by the values enshrined in the constitutions more than the common citizens because they are representatives of the public so with that we will end today's issues i hope it was helpful i hope you people uh, will start again getting back to the rhythm of current affairs with the news in 30 minutes 
and if you please love the video please make sure that you like share and subscribe thank you so much guys for tuning in i'll keep uh, posting the videos and will be consistent till the end of april please start preparation for prelims do not neglect the prelims preparation and if you have any doubts please contact me in my telegram id sudeep8987 okay guys please share this video with your friends so that they can make good use of it more number of views will incentivize me more to do this on a consistent basis thank you so much i'll see you tomorrow bye guys